Hi, this is Brian Long. Um, I'm going to give you a walk through building an Android application using RemObjects Oxygen for Java. Um, we're looking here at Visual Studio 2012 running in Windows 8 and uh, this is where Oxygen lives and runs. Uh, so we'll start off uh, by creating a new project and this project is going to obviously start from scratch. It's going to start from an Android application project template um, and clearly in the case of a demo it's not going to be an overly complicated project but it will allow us to look at a, a number of practical considerations that you will regularly bump into when building Android applications and as such simple as it may be um, it will have value um, for those practical considerations and also because it will be a vaguely useful application. Uh, we're going to build the ubiquitous torch application. So we'll give the uh, project a name, um, press OK, and let the project template get instantiated. Um, once it's instantiated, we've got the standard members of a template Android application. For example, um, in the text editor here, we have the class that represents the main activity of the application, where in Android an activity is essentially a screen full of UI. Um, so this is the uh, main screen in the template application. Navigating around the Solution Explorer, in addition to the main activity class, we've got a whole bunch of resources, including uh, the application icon, um, three different versions of it for low, medium and high density screen resolutions. Uh, we also have the layout, which is the definition of the user interface that will be rendered onto the screen. This is an XML file. Uh, an XML file, even um, though it doesn't have exactly a .xml file extension, it has a .layout XML extension. Uh, the reason for the specific um, non-XML file extension is such that a XML schema can be set up inside of Visual Studio and we get some sort of IntelliSense whilst working in the uh, XML layout syntax. So the layout for the template application has a linear layout and that allows a number of different views or controls to be uh, laid out either uh, horizontally one after another or vertically in this case one after another um, although there is only one control in this particular case. Uh, in addition to the layout we have uh, a bunch of string resources in an Android XML again XML but with IntelliSense file. Um, there's a selection of strings uh, defined in this resource file and again the benefit of um, working with string resources as opposed to literal strings is the Android resource system makes automatic substitution of strings under different local uh, under different localized versions of Android very trivial if you place your translated resource strings in appropriately named resource files or more correctly, in resource files in appropriately named directories. The other thing that's in the project is the Android manifest. The manifest is another XML file and it's the mechanism by which your application communicates to the operating system what constituent components it has that the operating system will need to find, uh, what facilities of the operating system that it may be using, what version of the operating system it can run on. For example, uh, this one can run on Android's fourth release at the earliest, the fourth release being the donut release, which I think was Android 1.6. Um, in this manifest we can see that there are some specifications are, uh, to do with the application. So we've got a description of the application referencing one of those string resources. This is the app name string resource. Currently says org.me.torch. Let's just change that. Um, there's a reference to the icon. The icon and the label will be used to identify the application in the standard Android app list. Um, and additionally, uh, the activity, the singular activity, which is listed here in this activity node, which has some complicated looking stuff inside of the element, uh, but all of all this actually really means is that this activity is the main activity. When Android is asked to invoke the application, this is the activity that should be launched. Um, so this activity has a label. This is the thing that will be drawn on the title bar uh, at the top of the activity. And again, it's using the same application name, which is fine. Um, and an identification as to what the class that underlies this uh, specified activity. OK, so that's a run through of what we currently got. What we now need to do is to add another activity. 
a second screen. So we're going to have a main screen which has a button. The button will do something different to what the template application does. Um, and the goal is going to be that the button will launch the torch screen. The torch being a fully white bright screen which allows us in a dark room to see where we might be going. So we need to add in another um, activity. So we can do that by uh, right clicking and choosing uh, add new item and we'll pick an activity and we'll call it uh, the bulb activity and what this gives us is a second source file bulb activity and a second layout file bulb activity dot, dot layout in addition, um, if, again, if we look back at the manifest, we'll see that um, the second activity has been added in, or a declaration for it has been added into the manifest to specify to Android that there are now two activities, and um, it tells us what their uh, underlying class is. Uh, this particular activity won't ever have any um, child element, so if we want, we can just uh, neaten that up slightly. OK, so the label for this second activity is currently a literal string. Perhaps we'll just give it the same application name label as the first activity. And then I guess what we need to do is go back to the main activity and tidy up some of the template code um, and replace it uh, with code that will launch the second activity. So let's get rid of the counter. Um, we'll leave the code that tries to um, locate the view or control via its ID. Uh, the ID is my button and that ID was created uh, in the main layout. Here is the definition of the button. Um, here is the ID of the button and the fact that there's a plus sign there indicates that we're adding or creating or specifying this is the new ID of this um, new button object. So we'll leave the button um, identification and variable assignment and we'll leave the event handler setup code and what we'll do is we'll go and replace the contents of the current event handler uh, with some new content. Uh, we'll declare a new variable which is a variable of type intent and an intent is like a, an object uh, version of a message. It's, um, it's a way of communicating around the system between activities and it allows you to couple information along with that message but primarily it's a way of communication from one activity to another. So in this case we'll assign uh, to this variable a new intent and the new intent uh, constructor has a variety of overloads. Uh, we'll pick the one that takes uh, the context um, that uh, is setting the thing up, which is this context or this activity. The activity class extends or inherits from the context class. And uh, the second parameter is the type of the um, activity that we wish to start up to initiate. So we'll use uh, type of and then we'll pass in the name of our activity class. Um, having created the uh, intent, we can then pass it to the start activity method. So that deals with launching the bulb activity from this button. Um, however, it probably would be prudent to modify the caption on the button, um, which currently says click me. We'll change that to turn on torch. Right, what next? Um, the bulb activity layout is empty right now. Um, it's got a linear layout uh, as a placeholder ready to contain a bunch of views to lay out our target user interface. In this particular case, we don't want anything on it. In fact, we just want the whole thing empty, as it currently is, um, with a background color of white. So in fact, let's get rid of the gravity. and Let's change the uh, background to be as required white. Um, you'll see that um, white is a color resource predefined in the Android namespace. Okay, that's um, well, that's our first uh, iteration of this application. So let's see what it looks like. I currently have 
um, an Android emulator um, running. This is uh, running uh, the Froyo version of the Android operating system, um, which is starting to look a little dated now with the ice cream sandwich and jelly bean kicking about. But anyway, um, I'm running Froyo, and uh, we can verify that if we launch this application that it will end up on that emulator by having a look in the project options and checking the Android tab and seeing what the Android device um, is specified to be and currently it's set to default which basically means if there is only one android device connected it'll go there <clears throat> in addition you can set up a specific default device on the off chance you have several android devices say several emulators running or an emulator and a physical device as it happens i do have an emulator and a physical android device connected to this machine so we'll specifically choose the emulator just so we know exactly what's going on um, and we'll Try and launch the application, hope that uh, there aren't any problems, and that it ends up uh, running in the emulator. So it's building in the background there. Built. Build succeeded. And now it's being deployed to the emulator, and after being deployed, it will be launched in about now ish. So, Super Torch, um, we have the option to turn on the torch. So, if we click that button, we get a white activity, which is great. It's great. Well, it's OK. It could be greater. Um, the issue here is the fact that, well, first of all, for maximum luminance, you really want the white background to be full screen. So we could perhaps be wanting to get rid of this title and also get rid of the status bar. So th those two steps take us to a full screen activity. In addition, um, you can't really tell on an emulator, but uh, if we just run it on the physical device, we'd see that, that white background isn't um, as bright as it could be. It's just regular brightness. We could ask for maximum brightness to get the maximum luminance and therefore have the torch be as useful as possible. So those steps uh, we'll try and attend to uh, now. Let's switch back to Visual Studio. Uh, switch back to the bulb activity, uh, which currently doesn't have anything in it. Um, we'll add in some code to request the title bar to disappear and to request full screen and we'll do that when the activity gets created but before the layout is assigned to the content view property. The first thing we'll do is remove the title bar from the activity. Um, the title bar is considered to be a feature of the window uh, or removing the title bar as a feature so um, we specify features by referencing um, a flag inside of the window class which we're not actually seeing the reason we're not seeing it is because uh, we're looking at members of the window property um, the window is a property as well as being a class so to get access to the members of the class i'm going to have to fully qualify the window class and then hopefully we can get access to the no title feature. Uh, the next thing we need to do is to request full screen which will remove the status bar. That is done by setting a flag, a flag of the window property. Um, so let's uh, type this bit in. Um, okay, so um, we set the uh, full screen flag into the um, element of the flags array represented by the full screen flag. In other words, it can either be zero or it can have the flag value. We're assigning the flag value, uh, replacing the previous zero value. Um, and finally, um, in order to request maximum brightness, we need to specify an attribute of the window property. So override the brightness and go um, uh, full out. Great. Well, let's just check that that looks okay on the emulator. Uh, we should get a quicker build second time round, hopefully.
this is a virtual machine so who knows who knows we have built and so we're now deploying um, so this old version of the torch should disappear then the new one should come in and be launched uh, if we turn on the torch okay so the title bar's gone the status bar's gone but we can't tell about the brightness so okay let's ignore the emulator let's go back to look at our target devices and perhaps choose the physical device launch the application and uh, check it on the physical device um, I do have some uh, a little webcam tool which hopefully will allow us to see a physical Android device uh, let's see if it works and in the background um, we can see that the uh, build of the application has just succeeded so that's now being deployed to the Android device um, so I'm going to go down and turn on the torch and you'll notice it's massively bright so much so that the white balancing has <laughs> is needed to black out everything except for the screen so it has gone for maximum brightness and the fact that everything else has gone black kind of emphasizes that so if we uh, just go back now everything settles back down again and it kind of just gets a handle on them um, being able to see everything other than just the screen okay so that's um, a good start however there's a problem a potential problem um, if you're wandering around in the darkness with your torch um, an Android device typically has a screen timeout so after say 30 seconds the screen will turn off and you'll be left in the dark which is no good really for a torch application so we need to take this into consideration and ask ourselves how we can tell the screen to remain on for the duration until the user specifically says we've had enough let's exit this activity and the way we do this is using something called a wake lock um, a screen brightness wake lock um, so we're going to talk to the power manager service in android and we're going to request a wake lock object and then when the activity the bulb activity starts or more correctly when it resumes we're going to acquire a wake lock and then as soon as the bulb activity disappears either because we switch away or because it's been terminated um, we're going to release the wake lock so for the duration of the bulb activity um, the screen will um, remain awake okay so let's get rid of this go back to the bulb activity and uh, we'll start it around about here Okay, so we need a we need a local variable. Um, so let's have a local variable called wake lock. In fact, uh, make it a variable called wake lock of type power manager dot wake lock. Um, and then after the UI has been set up, we'll try and locate the power manager, and we can do that by asking for the specific system service which is the power service cast it to the object that it actually will be and then we can say that our wake lock is assigned power manager dot new wake lock and this takes a couple of parameters uh, the first parameter is uh, what type of wake lock it is. Well, it's a screen bright wake lock, uh, brightness wake lock. And the second parameter is the class which is um, the wake lock is going to be associated with. So it's this class's name. Okay, so now we need to acquire and release the wake lock. So I'm going to declare, well, I'm going to override um, the on resume and the on pause uh, methods of the activity. Implement those. Call inherited in both of them. And when we're resuming, which is the last method to trigger before we're fully active as an activity, I'm going to say wake lock um, dot acquire and 
when we're on our way out. And the first thing that happens on our way out, if we're exiting or being switched away from, wake clock dot release. Okay. Um, that is now a well-behaved um, application with regards to acquiring and releasing a wake lock. So let's just uh, let's go back to um, the emulator, I think, and we'll run that up in the background. Okay, so the torch gets turned on, and um, ah, 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 it's failed. Oh dear, something's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we going to find out what has gone wrong? Well, probably a good way would be to run the application in the debugger and see what the debugger has to say about that problem. Um, okay, so let's rerun it. But in debug mode, the little empty triangle is start without debugging. The green solid triangle, or what is green when it's not already in the process of building, the green solid triangle is build and run in the debugger. So it says it's up and running. Um, it's a little bit slower in the debugger, sometimes a lot slower, particularly in a virtual machine, but uh, hopefully we'll get by. So the application starts up, it tries to connect to the debugger, the connection is established, the primary activity starts up, and so we see the torch button. We press the button, and the failure occurs round about now, and so hopefully the debugger will spot the problem and tell us what's going on. Indeed. It says we've got a runtime exception, and the runtime exception is that it can't start the bulb activity, or it can't resume the bulb activity, thanks to a security exception. Apparently neither the user of the device nor the process has got the permission wake lock. Uh -huh. A wake lock is something that requires permission to use, much like many things, such as sending text messages, looking at the um, phone logs, using the dialer. Many things require a permission to be asserted. When a user installs the application from the Android Marketplace or Google Play, the permission will be presented to the user and the user will be told that the application requires the permission. Therefore, the user is told kind of the sorts of things that the application wants to do with the device. And it's up to the user to then say yes or no with that information in hand. So we have to assert the permission that we want to use the wake lock. So we'll do that and we'll break the application and stop stop the application. We'll go to the Android manifest, which is where we set these up, which is where we set up um, permissions. Um, inside of the manifest we will say uses uses permission whoops Android name equals, well, let's see, what was it? It was that one, wasn't it? Okay, so that's that problem fixed, hopefully. Let's close that. Rerun without the debugger this time, perhaps. So that's busy building. So if we switch over to the em, whoops, if we switch over to the emulator, no. Right, so now it's been deployed, now it's being launched. Here we have the next iteration of the program. We turn on the torch and the screen comes up. So now the permission um, is being respected and things go much smoother. Obviously, with the application being deployed to the device by the, de by the development environment, um, no permission checks have been asked of me, the user. But in the general case, of a regular user, they would be presented with a list of permissions that the application requires. The next thing we'll add to the project is a menu on the main screen. So let's get out of the emulator again, pop back to the main script. Well, actually, um, the menu will need some text. When the menu pops up, we'll need to see some text. So we'll define a string to represent uh, to contain that text. Um, so we'll call that string about, well, about menu. Um, we'll give it an appropriate uh, menu caption. Um, and then we'll pop along to the uh, main activity. Um, and just before we write any code, we'll define the menu resource. Um, you can set up menus entirely in code. 
much the same way you can set up um, screen or activity layouts entirely in code. Um, it's often more convenient to set them up in resource files. So let's add a new item and we'll make it a, an application menu and we'll call it the main menu because it's uh, on the main activity. Um, we'll add that to the project and that gets added in an appropriate subdirectory called menu and it's got uh, an appropriate basic template. Inside of this menu we're going to add a new menu item. Um, the menu item is going to be identified uh, by an ID such that when the uh, menu item is selected the code can work out which one it was. Um, and this is going to be um, a new ID so we use the plus sign um, as well as an ID we'll give it an icon this icon will be a predefined drawable resource um, that Android comes pre-packaged pre with uh, you can find um, a whole swathe of resources that Android comes um, packaged with by looking up the Android class uh, or the Android.R class in um, the Android documentation. In fact, actually, let's do that. So uh, here's Internet Explorer. Let's go to d.android.com and when the Internet wakes up, we're taken there. Um, so if we look for the R class, we can see that we have Android.R and all the subclasses, Android.R.ID, Android.R.Color, which is where we find white, and also Android R Drawable. So in here we can find all the predefined symbols for the predefined Android drawables. Um, again, when the internet wakes up, we can have a little browse down, and the one we're going to use is oh, it's a menu icon. Ah, here it is. Uh, so it's an icon <clears throat> for use in a menu, uh, represents information and details. Ultimately, all these resource identifiers are just numbers, so all we can do is just find that a symbol exists uh, and then maybe use it. So we'll use um, Android colon drawable uh, slash IC menu, whoops, menu info details. Okay. Um, the final thing is we need to specify the title string or the caption of the menu, and that is going to be that string that we defined. And that string we defined was about menu. Okay, so now we ought to close that item. That should now be a legitimate XML. And we can go back to the main activity and we'll define some methods which are necessary when dealing with a menu. There are two methods involved. One of them will allow the menu to be created and another one will respond to the chosen menu items. So the first one is on create options menu. Um, it does take an, uh, one argument. One of the things about the Java um, system is that Java libraries don't have the names of the arguments to methods compiled into them. So when IntelliSense pulls out the information above the fact that there is a, 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 a virtual method that can be overridden called onCreateOptionsMenu, it does find the type um, of the argument is menu, but there is no information about the name of the argument. So uh, we can either we can either go and look it up, um, or we can just type in a suitable one. So it's going to be a menu, so we'll call it menu. Um, the next one we're going to use is on um, options item selected and the parameter here is a menu item so we'll call it item um, control shift c to invoke class completion um, in the menu creation when we have a menu resource what we need to do is to inflate that menu resource and we do that by talking to the menu inflator property 
asking it to inflate the menu and specifying um, the resource identifier. Well, our dot menu would be the location that we'd find all of our menu resource identifiers, but there is no menu listed. And that's because all of the uh, resources that we add into our resource directory do get processed and into uh, these appropriate resource identifier members of r.string, r.id, r.menu and so on, but only after a compilation. So let's just do a build. Uh, we can get rid of the comments. Go back here, r.menu, there we go. Uh, dot main menu, jolly good. And finally, we'll just leave here returning the true value. Now, when the user chooses the menu and then chooses the about item, uh, what we can say is if the item dot item ID happens to be the ID that we associated with our menu item, which will be that, then we'll do something. And the something that we'll do is we'll just print out, we'll, we'll just invoke a little pop-up message, a pop-up message called a toast. Um, toast is a class and there's a static method called make text. Um, in there we can pass in a context. Since we're in an activity and an activity is a context, we'll pass in self. Um, then we can pass in a string. Normally we'd use a string resource, but here we'll just uh, type in an appropriate uh, little message. There we go. Uh, I was just using the numeric keypad there to get a copyright symbol. Alt 0169 on a numeric keypad uh, gives a copyright symbol, but uh, numlock, um, I switched it the wrong way. We need numlock on to use these, uh, these numeric keypad buttons. Copyright me. Okay, so the third parameter is how long the toast should remain on the screen. And there are two flags. For this and we can have a long toast or a short toast we'll have a long one now this call to make text will return a toast object uh, what what we do with the toast object is up to us we can keep it for later so we can keep reusing it but in this case I'm simply going to go right ahead and show it we'll also exit uh, with a value of true to indicate we've handled this uh, assuming it was that ID if the method is called with another ID then we'll exit saying that um, we didn't handle it. OK, so with the menu on board, we'll rerun it in the emulator and we'll just check that the menu works. Uh oh. Um, right, so made a bit of a boo boo with uh, the call to inflate. Obviously, there are more parameters than what we put in. Oh, OK. So we put in the resource ID, which is the integer, but then we didn't pass in the menu that we want to associate that with. There we go, that should be better. Okay, so that's building a little bit more successfully. Let's pop over to the emulator. Hopefully, now that the build has succeeded, the uh, emulator image will quickly be dispatched and oh, well, the image of the app will be dispatched to the emulator and launched. And uh, therefore, I can then press on the button Oh no, we don't need to do that because the menu is on the main activity. We'll press the menu button. There's our text. That's the predefined Android icon. If I choose this menu, there we have our toast. So that's a little bit of extra functionality. Menus are very commonplace um, in Android applications and that just adds a little bit of a finishing touch to our Torch application. Just before moving on to the final part, I'm going to relent and I'm going to take out this literal string and turn it into a string resource. Um, to make a string resource, just add another string element, give it a name. And uh, then put in the value of that string resource as with all the others. Then. In order to actually make use of the text within that string resource, well, firstly, we need to make sure we remember what the string resource was called. Uh, but then in order to refer to it, 
it won't be in the list here. It won't be in the IntelliSense or code completion list because we haven't recompiled the program. As soon as we recompile that ID, oh, that mem that string resource will be a member of the R dot string, cl string class. Um, now, the thing about that expression is that expression is just an integer. Um, it just identifies a given resource. All the resource ID, all the resource identifiers are just integers. Um, in order to actually turn this into a string, we need to use the activity class's string array property. Okay, so that should then give exactly the same behavior as before, but it's done in more the way becoming of an Android developer. Okay, final thing we'll do is we're going to add in a dialogue, a confirmation dialogue in the bulb activity. Let's just get rid of some of this uh, stuff here. Um, there is a little bit of typing here, so to avoid uh, watching me fumble uh, around and correct things, um, this time I'll just uh, do a bit of copying and pasting and explain the code as we're going along. Um, the dialogue uh, is going to is going to be triggered from a menu on the bulb activity, so a new menu and a new dialogue and some new string resources are required. Um, and the idea of the dialogue is it says, are you sure you want to close the torch, just to ensure that the torch isn't being turned off through accidental finger presses. So, first things first, we will need some strings, so I'll just copy those across from elsewhere. So we've got um, the menu caption, close torch, um, we've got um, a title of a dialogue, torch switching off, and the message in the dialogue, do you really want to switch off the torch? Okay, now we need to have a new menu resource. So another application menu, uh, this one we'll call bulb menu, and I'll copy the definition of the menu item that's going to um, that's going to appear in this in this um, bulb activities menu. It's got an ID bulb menu close, that's a new ID. It's got an icon, which is again again a predefined Android icon identified by the drawable resource ID IC menu close clear clear close clear cancel. The text that's going to represent the menu, i.e. the menu caption, is going to be the close torch string that we just added into the string resources. So now into the bulb activity and we'll pop in some code and control V okay so what do we have here let's try and make some space um, we have um, just like we did with the main activity um, an override of the method which creates the menu using the inf menu inflator pass in the menu resource ID and the menu and then um, exit with true to indicate that yes we have created one. If the menu item is chosen, in other words if the item which is passed into the options item selected method is the resource identifier for the item in the menu resource then we're going to call a method called show dialog. And show dialog is going to um, invoke the dialog for us. The dialog is identified by an ID this is a constant that I will need to define, close torch dialog. Um, however, I also still need to define these methods which I've added here. So control shift C should hopefully do that. Except it doesn't really know that I think in each case we are overriding. OK, and then What was it called again? Closed torch DLG. Okay, so we'll just define that to be some arbitrary identifying number, um, which is going to be passed into show dialog, and that will cause this to execute. Um, the very first time you create a dialog, this will execute to build a dialog object, which is then cached and is reused every time we subsequently pass the same ID to show dialog. So the first time that we um, cause this dialog to be created, it will check that it is definitely the closed torch dialog being triggered. 
and then we're going to build an alert dialog and we do that with an alert dialog builder the alert dialog builder is going to have its title set its message set um, those are going to be set to two of the strings that we added in the string resource file it's also going to have a positive and a negative button set up uh, a positive button um, identified by the yes string the android predefined yes string and a negative button identified by the predefined Android no string. Those are going to have associated with them some functionality. The functionality is represented here by two lambda expressions. Uh, lambda expressions are just simplified forms of anonymous methods. So what we're saying here is that the functionality is a method with two parameters called dialog and which, the types of which will be worked out by uh, the compiler, and the implementation of the method we'll just call finish. In other words, if the close torch dialog confirmation box comes up and it says do you really want to choose, do you really want to close this torch screen and we say yes then we need to call the finish method of the activity which will close this activity therefore turning the torch off returning us to the main activity if um, instead we say no it was a mistake then we simply cancel the dialog and the torch stays on um, the dialog is returned by us creating or asking the builder to create the dialog and exiting it. If um, onCreateDialog is triggered by some other ID, then we just exit calling the inherited method. Okay. So that's the functionality. There is one other thing that we can do just to make this a little more interesting. Um, as well as closing the dialog uh, using the menu, the user can also um, exit the dialog by pressing the back button, which will take them back to the main screen. We can modify the behavior of the back button. Uh, of course, normally, we'd be very keen to enhance the functionality and make sure that we do still go back to where we came from, but in this case, not. Instead, in this case, we will call same thing we will evoke the same dialogue um, like that now let's see how many problems we have um, with compiling this let's see what the compiler objects to build, oh, build has failed build has failed and it says there is no such static member bulb. What did we call? Oh, we called it bulb menu. Uh, it was called bulb menu. Okay, and what else? Anything else? No, I think we're okay now. So let's. Um, there is a note that uh, the call to show dialog is obsolete, but that's uh, really uh, something that happens in the most recent versions of the Android operating system. By default, uh, when we reference uh, the Android SDK, it's defaulting to the most recent one that we have installed. So if we go back to the project options, project options, oh, it's down here. Okay, let's uh, see if we can move that up here. Right. We go back to the Android um, options in the project properties. Uh, we can see that the target platform is set to the latest one installed, which in my case is uh, the 15th iteration. And yeah, certain things to do with creating dialogues, they prefer you to uh, go a different avenue, go down a different avenue using fragments. But if you're still targeting a wide range of target operating systems, uh, for example, dating back to uh, Froyo, which is Android 2.2, or Eclair, which is presumably Android 2.1 maybe 2.0, um, yeah, perhaps 2.0, uh, then it's appropriate to still use some of the older APIs. So we're not worried too much about that. Let's instead run the application and switch over to the uh, emulator and await um, to see the application up. And we can check the behavior of the menu and of the back button from the torch screen, the bulb screen. So the application is being deployed and so it should now be launching um, here it comes now we'll turn on the torch we see there is a menu switch off the torch we choose the button do you really want to switch off the torch no 
do you really want to switch off the torch? Yes. And the finish method is called on that activity, and we go back to where we came from. Um, so that's what things look like. Um, let's go back to the torch and just press the back button. Same thing. That's what a dialog looks like um, on, what did I say this was? Froyo, which is Android 2.2. Let's have a look again at the actual physical device. Let's go to the project properties. Where are they this time? They're down here again. Why are they down here? Um, and we'll target the physical device. Okay. Let's now run the application and target the physical device, which happens to be running gingerbread. Um, so it's not going to look all, an awful lot different, but um, it's a HTC variant of gingerbread, so it might look a little bit different. Let's um, make sure the webcam software is up. So there's the device. The webcam software hopefully will stick with us. There's the application launching. Oh, <laughs> you can't click on a photograph, can you? Press the button. We get a very bright screen. Now, let's press the back button. There's the dialogue. Turn. Can we... We get that focused any better. It says torch switching off, and then it says really switch off torch. Anyway, you can see that the basic layout of that UI on Gingerbread is extremely similar to how it looks on Froyo. However, let's uh, let's just switch over to another um, device. Let's get that one out of the way. Pop this one up. Oops. This one is running ice cream sandwich. Uh, and let's go back to Visual Studio. Relaunch the application after refreshing and choosing the different physical device. Save. Relaunch. And we'll pop back to the webcam software and just try ooh, ooh, just try and focus. Okay, focus a bit. That's not so bad. Okay, so hopefully that should get launched around about now. So there's a button, you can't see the text because of the uh because of the um lighting situation. Um, anyway, I'll press the button. Uh, we get the torch. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to press the menu button. Oh, there's a little menu down the bottom. Switch off torch. Notice it's got a black background and white text, which is different to how it was with um, uh, earlier versions of Android. When we ring up the dialog, where well, the dialog actually looks pretty similar. Uh, the menu, however, does look a bit different. So let's cancel and cancel. Bring up the menu, bring up the menu. Yeah, the two menus do look a little bit different. Oh dear. Out of, everything's out of focus now. Well, anyway, you get the idea. Let's give up with that. Um, okay, so what we've been through over the last uh, half an hour or 40 minutes, whatever it's been, um, what we've been through is the process of building up um, an Android application using REM objects Oxygen for Java, dealing with things like permissions, dealing with things like resource strings, adding in menus, adding in confirmation dialogues, adding in invocations of additional secondary activities, and getting something which is actually not, not that exciting, but it is actually a functional little application out the other end. So hopefully um, this has been... Um, reasonably educational and uh, I guess I'll be back with another video soon hopefully thank you for listening goodbye